Psalm chapter number 84, we find that this, this unnamed psalmist writes an entire chapter thanking God, praising God, giving glory to the Lord for God's house. Twelve entire verses and an entire chapter that this man writes a whole song about the fact that he appreciates the place that is set apart, sanctified, a place that's safe from the world where he can come, hear some singing, hear some preaching, be around God's people, and feel the presence of the Lord in his heart. Now, I thank God for that kind of place myself tonight. The psalmist said it like this in verse number 1, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, and whose heart are the ways of them who pass in through the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, say law. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Here we find one of these orphan psalms in the Bible. Some psalms, many of them attributed to David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Twelve of them attributed to Asaph, David's song leader. Some are even attributed to Moses. Here we find there are many psalms that are not attributed to anyone. The, the name of the author is not included in the psalm. If I had to take a stab or a guess at who I thought wrote the psalm, it does have the fingerprints of David all over it. David did love the house of God as much as any man that ever drew a breath. Uh, but regardless of what human instrument it was, we know the Holy Ghost wrote it, inspired it, breathed on it, and put it in the book for us to appreciate tonight. And here we find this psalmist gives us 12 verses simply thanking God and lifting him up for the place known as the house of God. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very well aware of my dispensations. I'm very well aware of my Old Testament and my New Testament and the difference between Israel and the church. I understand in the Old Testament, God had a tabernacle for his people. And in the New Testament, God's got a people for his tabernacle. I get all that. I understand all that. But you can't deny the fact when we get into the New Testament, it was the Apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentile church that did say, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, if I tarry long that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Even the apostle Paul recognized and realized there was a place. There was a spot where the called out assembly could meet and worship and give glory to the God of heaven. And even though it may be a little different today than it was back in the book of Psalms, I thank God for a place tonight. And here we find the psalmist simply spends 12 verses telling everybody that this is his favorite place. This is the place he loves. This is the place he longs to be at. And I just want to piggyback on the psalmist and just echo his sentiments and just brag on the place for a while. And tonight I'm going to preach on, uh, this is my favorite place. Yes. Or maybe I'll preach on, I love this place tonight. Yes. You say, but preacher, this ain't your place. I know, but this place is just like the place where I come from. So I like this place. Yes. 
Uh, we, we preach the same book and talk about the same Savior and feel the same Spirit and have the same fellowship and sing the same songs and worship in the same way. I love places like this. I believe the only thing that stays the hand of God's judgment on America are places like this that still preach the book and still send missionaries and still support the work of God and still try and win people to Christ. I believe the Lord likes places like this too because in the book of the Revelation it said the last place Jesus was walking was in the midst of the golden candlesticks even the Lord likes walking around in the midst of his people and in the church tonight if I could outline the chapter this way before I get into my message tonight we find there are three verses that the psalmist is going to give us very vivid word picture illustrations tonight some beautiful illustrations of why he loves the house of God before we look at that let me just outline the text to you this way. He said that this was his favorite place because it was a lovely place. Verse number one, he said how amiable. The word amiable means lovely. He said how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. He said when I think about that place I think man, I love that place. I think the best memory he's saying the best memories I got in my life is down there at that place. I got good memories. I, I come from a good family. We took vacations together and I tried and do the same thing with my children but can I say the greatest memories that I have in my life are not from Disney World or Universal Studios they're not from some cruise they're not from a ball game the greatest memories I have of my life are spent at the house of God around the things of God tonight when I think about that place I think man that's a lovely place he said it wasn't just a lovely place it should be a longed for place verse number 2 he said my soul longeth yea even fainteth for the court of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. He said, man, I, I can't wait to get back down there again. He said, from service to service, I just look forward to it. People think I'm crazy, desiring, longing, looking forward to getting back down there. But he said, there ain't nowhere else I'd rather be. I can't wait to come back and hear another message and sing another song and see them familiar faces again, anticipate what God might do in our life. It should be a place we long for tonight. Sadly, we're living in a day where it seems like coming to the house of God and being around the things of God, you can just take it or leave it and still claim to be a Christian. There is no such New Testament model as that tonight. When you read the New Testament and when you read those epistles in the New Testament, you'll find that the church is high priority. You'll find that the church is top priority. Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. God purchased the church with his own blood. The book, of the, the book of the Acts is written about the starting of the local church. Uh, Romans to Philemon is either written to local churches or to pastors of local churches or to a member of the local church. Uh, we read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are written to local churches. 1st and 2nd Peter written to members of local churches. The book of the Revelation is written to seven local churches. It should be a place we long for tonight. It's a lovely place, a long for place. It should be a life lively place. Verse number four, verse four said blessed are they that dwell in thy house <laughs> they will be still praising thee. The psalmist said every time you go down there they all time praising God. It don't matter if it's a Sunday morning, if it's a Sunday night, if it's a midweek service. You count on this. When you get down there, then people's going to be worshiping the Lord. They just all the time praise. I thank God for some places where the shout has not died out. Where it ain't just dry and cold and dead. You know why we're losing some of our young people today? Because they go to dead church. Ain't no young and ever like going to a funeral home. And I've been to some churches that resembled funeral homes. May I say this crowd or to be the most jacked up excited crowd on the face of the planet we got something to be excited about tonight I've been to some churches they start at 10 o'clock sharp end at 12 o'clock dull I mean it's so cold the frosty the snowman I skate something down the aisle dry and dead brother I can't stand it I refuse to go to dead church I refuse to participate in dead church if I won't go to church I want it to be lively tonight it's a lovely place, a long for place, a lively place. It's a place that'll lift you up. 
Verse number 5 and 7. Watch what he said, verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Verse 7 said, they go from strength to strength, and they get this strength, he said, when they appear in Zion. That's where the house of God was at. When they appear before God, he said, it's a place you can come in lower than a snake's belly in a wagon track. He said, but by the time you walk out, you done got lifted up. I mean, you come in, feel low and feel beat down and busted up. But by the time you walk out, man, you kind of got a little spring in your step. You lift your head up. I I mean, God lifts us up in this place. It's a place where God's listening at. Verse number 8, it said, O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. I know you can pray at the house and you should. I know you can pray in your car and you should. But there's something special about getting down at the house of God when the Lord's at home and calling on Him and hearing your prayers. There's something special about stuff like that. It's a place where we get light at. Look at verse number 11. It's the place we get light. He said, for the Lord God is a S-U-N sun and shield. It's a place God gives light on our pathway at. How many times have you walked into this place needing direction, needing discernment, needing God to speak to your heart about a certain decision in your life, and you walked in saying, Lord, I don't know which way to go. I don't know which way to take. But by the time you walk out God had done shine down on your path through his countenance and through his presence and through the word I can't tell you brother Doug how many times I have got out of the pulpit and one of our members come up to me and said preacher I was going to talk to you after church and get some counsel about something but preacher I don't even need it no more while you're preaching the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and the word of God gave light and I don't even need to talk to you no more thank you preacher God gave me the answer I need how many times have you gotten light down at the house of God it's a place we learn how to walk with God he said in the last part of verse 11 no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly you know how we learn how to walk with God nobody in this building learned how to live for God on their own nobody's a lone ranger that figured out the Christian life by yourself no 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 you learned how to walk with God because you came into a place like this heard a preacher like that listened to the word of God and it taught you how to live taught you how to talk taught you how to be the mother you should be and the daddy you should be and the Christian you should be and taught you how to study your Bible and how to pray and how to walk with the Lord and how to witness and how to worship we learned everything we know about God God down at his house tonight. It's a place we lean on the Lord. Verse number 12 said, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. We learn how to lean on him. I love this place. It's my favorite place. And there are three verses that I skipped over intentionally as we run down through this text that I believe show us why this psalmist loved this place so much. It's it's verses 3, verses 6, and verses 10. There are illustrations in this that I'd like to point out just for a few minutes tonight and I'll be done. The reason why he said that he loved this place, why it was his favorite place. Can I show them to you? I say, number one, I love this place because it is a place of sparrows. It's a place of sparrows and and another bird in the text, swallows. It's a place of sparrows and swallows. Watch what he said in verse 3. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. There are some very significant things tonight about these sparrows. They just sung about them a minute ago in the song that the foster family was singing. There are some very significant things when we see that sparrow as it relates to the Christian in the Word of God. You say, preacher, what's what's significant about the sparrow? What's that got to do with us and why we love this place? I I never seen no birds flying around. Well, no, but they are some odd birds at the house of God. Amen. Some strange birds hang around the house of God. And we find it's a place of sparrows. Well, what is it about these sparrows? Well, we find the sparrow is a worthless bird. The sparrow is a worthless bird. Jesus was preaching one time, Brother Weaver, and Jesus said this. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing singular? Two sparrows sold for 
A farthing. I looked up uh, how much a farthing was in Bible days. They said, Brother Christian, a farthing would be worth about a quarter of one cent. About one-fourth of one cent. Now, I'm not real smart, but I got this much figured out tonight. Brother Lancaster, if one sparrow is worth a quarter of a cent, then that means two sparrows is only worth half of a quarter of a cent. I don't even know how much that is. He said two sparrows sold for a farthing, two sparrows sold for a quarter of a cent. That means one of them is worth even less than that. It ain't worth nothing. It is an absolutely worthless bird tonight. It don't matter if it lives. It don't matter if it dies. It don't matter if it survives. It's just a plain old, little old, insignificant, worthless bird bird tonight but yet we find the worthless bird has found a house for herself is what it said in verse 3 the worthless bird has found a place where she done made a nest she done took up residence she has done found value in her life the worthless bird that means nothing to anyone else has found a place where she means something at say what's that got to do with us have you not looked around tonight that's what we are tonight just a bunch old worthless birds uh, I mean a bunch of old worthless sinners and it didn't matter to the world whether you lived or whether you died didn't matter to the world whether you survived or whether you didn't whether you drew another breath or not but thank God you yoked up down at the house of God and God saved you and God changed you you know what God's done God has given value to the worthless life God has put value in a life that the world said didn't mean anything and it wasn't worth God's saving it wasn't worth God using and it wasn't worth God doing nothing with but you got down to the house of God and God give you value as a singer and value as a teacher and value as a member and value as a preacher and value as an usher and value as a prayer warrior value as mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters value that we never found anywhere else let me say tonight I'm not looking for my value out there in what the world sees as value I'm looking to be valuable in what God sees as valuable and the prize jewel of God is his church tonight and I'm glad I have found value at a place this evening so many people looking for value yoke up at the house of God get up neck deep you'll find worth down there You'll find something to do down there. You'll find God give you purpose and God give you ability and God accentuate a gift in your life. The worthless bird found a place. Find he didn't only love the place because it was a place for these worthless birds, but then we also find it's a place for these wandering birds. Watch, it's not just the worthless bird that finds a place. The wandering bird finds the place. Watch what it said, verse 3. There's two birds in the text. The sparrow found a house, but then there's another bird. And the swallow, a nest for herself. Now, the swallow's an interesting bird, Preacher Foster. They say that the swallow is a bird that is what they call a migratory bird. They say the swallow is all the time on the move. They say that swallows can fly for up to 200 miles at a time without ever stopping to put its foot down. They say the swallow's constantly moving, wandering, searching, never seeming to find rest, never seeming to find a place where it ever stays for very long because it's always on the move. But yet we find this swallow... Build a nest. I mean, it planned to yoke up and stay for a while. Why? Why did the wandering bird that could never find peace build a nest at the house of God? One day I was sitting in my office, Brother James, and I was reading behind bird people, not Bible commentators, bird people. And I was reading about these swallows, and son, what one of these fellows said about swallows, I literally started laughing out loud and got all teared up and about shouted in my office. This is what he said about swallows. Listen to this. He said that swallows are not adapted to being on the ground at all and listen to this and when one does land 
It is one of two reasons. It is either by accident or because they needed help. The only reason why they land is on their part, it's an accident. But we don't believe in accidents. We believe in providence. It's either accident or it's because they're hurt, wounded, damaged, and they needed some help. I see the swallow, she done built a house. Why? Well, somehow she got hurt. Somehow she got wounded. Maybe, maybe the fowler that was trying to catch the birds like they did that day had chunked a rock at her or went through a sling or tried to catch her in a snare and she got loose but she was wounded. Somehow she has developed an injury and she's flying but she's on her last leg. She can't go no further but she don't know where to find rest because she's a wandering bird and she's tried everything and been everywhere that this world has to offer and she's found no rest for her sole of her foot and she's found no peace for her war out wings and she's on her last leg and about that time as accident would have it as providence would have it she sees a landing pad it's the courts of the living God and she comes in and says that looks as good a place as any and she just she crash lands I mean brother wads up slides up in to knock the door open slides up in to the altar of the living God and as she lays there wounded beat up broken about that time out from behind the veil walks a man with the linen ephod on walks a man dressed in the linen girl clothes of the priesthood and she thinks any minute now he's just going to stomp me he's just going to pick me up and chuck me out back but he doesn't he picks that bird up and begins to bind up its wounds and begins to to fix its heart and begins to fix its wing and when she finally gets better where she can fly she says you know what I don't believe I'm going to leave I believe I'm just going to stay here this place has been so good to me this place has been the biggest blessing in my life I think I'll just build a nest and I think I'll just hang out down here you know what this place is tonight it's a bunch of wandering birds some of y'all wandered out in that world and looked for everything everywhere to find rest uh, you run from bed to bug to bottle uh, run from this person to that person and you couldn't find no rest anywhere and you'd been wounded by the world and wounded by sin uh, uh, but thank God one day you come staggering in the back door of a little church like this wounded and hurt and God lets you come crash landing down in a pew uh, and the preacher got up good God almighty and the preacher got up and started preaching and the Holy Ghost started pouring in the oil of the Holy Ghost and the balm of Gilead and God started doing something in your life and God put something in your life for love for the house of God and we ain't wondering no more we ain't looking no more we ain't searching no more we have found the place where God puts broken lives back together again Amen <laughs> From the doors of an orphanage to the house of the king, I'm no longer an old outcast. I got a new song I sing. From rags to riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm unworthy to be here, but thank God I belong. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain been cleansed by the blood I'm a joint heir with Jesus as I travel this side I'm a part of the family the big family of God 
It's a place for the wandering bird. If tonight you in here and you wandering, looking, searching, look no further. You found a place of restoration. You found a place of redemption. You found a place of revival. You have found the place tonight. I love this place. <laughs> It's a place of sparrows, the worthless birds, and wandering birds. Can I say something else about these birds real fast and, and I'll hurry up and be done? It's a place that these are wise birds. These birds are smart. Some of y'all ain't even got a bird brain tonight. She's smarter than some of uh, some God's people. Watch what it says about this bird. Found the house, the swallow found a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. This, this wandering bird says, you know what? I know what it is like out yonder, wandering around. And I don't want my babies to have to know what that's like. I'm going to make sure I get them <laughs> to the altar. I'm going to make sure that I get them raised up in this place. You know why she had so much confidence in this place, in the house of God? Don't miss this. Because God, the God that wrote that, is Brother Jordan, the God that made her. So she knows something about God. Yeah. Even the animals know something about God. Yeah. Yeah. First time a donkey started talking, he knew something about God. Some of y'all ain't even smart as a donkey. And this girl knows something about God, this bird does. What does she know? She knows that the God that wrote the law had already, mm, had already given a commandment to his people how to treat baby birds if they ever run across them. Did you know that God in his law gave a commandment for how the people of God were supposed to treat baby birds if they walked up on them on the ground? No, that's in them boring passages that we skip over because it ain't got nothing to do with us. Ch let's do a little Bible study. It's Wednesday night. It's the church crowd. To hold your place here with me, we coming back. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22. Watch this commandment of the Lord and this, this bird. She knows about this. Deuteronomy 22, verse number 6. Deuteronomy 22, 6. This is what the Lord said, commanding Moses one of these laws. He said, if a bird's nest, said the swallow built a nest at the altar, if a bird's nest chanced to be before thee in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting. The word dam in the text, it's an Old Testament, Old English word for the mother. The dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs. Thou shalt not take the dam with the young, but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days. God done told that bird... If you ever get your babies down near where my people's at, they won't crush them. They won't kill them. They'll take care of them till they're old enough to fly on their own. You just make sure you get them close to where my people's at. See, the world had no such commandment. The world didn't matter. It didn't matter to them whether them eggs lived or died. They come across an egg in the way they just soon step on it, just crush it, just stick it out of the way. But God's people were instructed of how to tenderly take care of this mama bird and her eggs in the way. And this mama bird says, oh, if I can just get my babies down there to the altar. God's already told them people to watch over my... You know the safest place to get your children? You got them at the safest place. Boy, that blessed my heart. I'm with you, sister. That blessed my heart seeing a choir full of young people, teenagers and preteens up there worshiping God and giving glory to the Lord. And sing, Then y'all got to singing that. I've been sheltered by His grace. Thank good the Lord. Oh, my, I'm telling you, that was me, friend. I, I think to myself when I was a little boy, I was raised up around this all my life. I've been around this nine months before I was born. I'm glad I had a mom and daddy that made much 
much of this in my life. Put a love for this in my life. I don't despise it. I don't hate it. I thank God for it. And I'm watching my own children. I'm watching my four babies begin to fall in love with the church and fall in love with ministry. They found a place. Wise bird. Are you wise enough to get your children to the house of God? I read something the other day. I thought this was real profound. thought it was real profound. I re- a preacher put a post on Facebook and he said, I don't know why you, some of you mamas and daddies are so worried about Disney getting y'all's children. Travel ball already took them out of church a long time ago. Hey, 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 I ain't, against, I ain't against sports and such as that and entertainment. I'm all for it. But listen here, I was always taught this takes first precedence over any of it. I believe that. Call me old-fashioned. Call me what you want. I'm an old man in a young man's body, I guess. But, brother, I still believe that's the truth because I've proved it in my life and I've watched it work. I love this place place for wise birds you know what I read I read this they said this about these swallows I'm going to move off of this I'm just going to chunk out my last two points and hurry and let you go I preached too long last night so I ain't going to keep you long enough but I read this they said preacher Foster that these swallows wherever it is that they hatch their babies it don't matter how far those babies fly away when they get big enough to do so doesn't matter how far they go, they said there is a certain time in them babies' lives when they will come flying back to within a foot of the place they were born at. <laughs> it don't matter how far off they fly. It don't matter how far off they might wander. There is something that God put in them, a home and beacon, that at some point in their life will bring them right back to the spot where they was born that sounds like Proverbs 22 6 to me train up the child in the way he should go and when he's old he'll not depart from it I believe there's something if they ever get birthed at the house of God get born with a birth from above at the house of God it don't matter how far they run how far they wander there's a homing device in them where they will come flying back home I love this place, a place for sparrows. Can I say this as well? He says this down in verse number 6. It's not only just a place for sparrows and swallows, it's a place of springs and showers. Look at the picture he gives. It's the springs and the showers. He said, who passing through the valley of Baca, make it a well. A well is a spring. The rain, there's your showers also filleth the pools he said that place is a place of springs when we're down he said it's the valley of Baca the word Baca means weeping means a place of crying a valley of tears he said but I'm going to tell you something about the house of God it's a place that when you're walking through a valley of tears and a valley in a season of brokenness if you can ever get to the house of God, you can turn your weeping into a well. You could turn mourning into mourning. You, you, you can turn depression and discouragement into dancing. You can turn sorrow into singing at the house of God. You, I, 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 it blows my mind preacher it blows my mind so many people start having problems and start going through the valleys of Baca and they run from the church instead of to the church you are not going to get through your valley like you could apart from the local assembly you say what do we find when we get here oh we get here and all of a sudden a well starts bubbling up The Holy Ghost, the Lord puts something on the inside and we start getting around God's people. It starts bearing witness with us. You know what you find when you get to the well of the church? Jesus is there. Yeah, I ain't just just saying stuff. He is. So what do you mean by that? John chapter 4. If a well is a picture of the local assembly and when you study your Bible, a well is a picture of the local assembly. You know what you find then? 
When that busted up, messed up woman came to that well, somebody was already at the well waiting on her when she got there. She walked to that well and brother, she found acceptance. She found forgiveness. She found mercy. She found grace. And that was Jesus sitting on that well. You know what this place is? It's a place where messed up sinners broke up living in the valley of Baca come walking in and they don't, they don't get rocks thrown at them like you said, preacher. They don't get condemnation. They get mercy and they get grace and they get peace and they find Jesus is a sitting right here waiting on them when they show up. It, it's a place of springs when we're down. It's a place not just of springs when we're down. It's a place of showers when we're dry. He said in the last part of verse 6, the rain also filleth. That means there wasn't anything in them. It was just a dry divot in the ground. The rain also filleth the pools. You know what rain is? It is a supernatural act of God. We can't make it rain. You, you, you can't command it to rain. You know what rain is? It is a divine act of God's grace. It's supernatural. It's the blessing of God. You can smell rain. How many country people we got in here tonight know what I'm talking about? I mean, you can smell rain. I've been out in my yard before, and, and, and I, I tell my kids, I said, you smell that? What? It's fitting to rain. What do you mean it's fixing to rain? That's so you can smell it. I grew up in the country. You can smell it when it's on the way. Man, ain't nothing like coming to the house of God. It's like you can almost smell something's going to happen. You walk in and say, praise God. It's on the way, y'all. Yeah. You don't just smell it, but, but it's a sound. You can hear it. Elijah said this in 1 Kings. He said, I hear the, sa <laughs> I hear the sound of abundance of rain. You know what rain from heaven sounds like at the church? I'll tell you what, man, I, hallelujah. I'll tell you what rain from heaven sounds like at the church. It sounds like preaching. It sounds like Holy Ghost singing. It sounds like worship. And this is what it sounds like when it starts raining. It sounds something like this. At least in our church and at y'all's church, it sounds pretty much the same way to me. It sounds like it's like, <laughs> well, glory. Starting to rain. I feel I, that's raindrops right there. And then Sister So and so, about that time, she cuts loose and, whoo! Sounds like rain. Then you watch some of them, they, they ain't loud, but they doing this number right here. Tears coming down there. You say, what is that? That's the sound of abundance of rain. Where do we get that at? You get it here. And brother, how many times have you showed up just as dry as you could be? I mean, your spirit's dry, your soul's dry. And you walk in, and by the time you leave, you feel like, man, I'm telling you what, I've been, I have been lubricated up. Praise the Lord. God has just showered down on me. I mean, I, I, I come in empty, and I'm leaving full. I don't know about y'all. That I, I'm preaching my own personal testimony a lot of times. Where I walk into church, and I'm just dry and empty. Son, by the time I, I, I leave out, I'm plumb gargling. I'm so full. I mean, it's, I'm about to drown. Where you get that at? You get it here. You ought to love this place. You ought to encourage others to get to this place. Can I say this to you? This is the greatest evangelistic tool that the church has. Say, so what do you mean by that? I mean, look, I, 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 I'm for knocking on doors. We do it down where I'm at. I believe your test is a great thing. I believe in street preaching. We take our young men street preaching. I believe in all that stuff. We, we participate. But I'm telling you, the greatest evangelistic tool the church has for helping people or seeing sinners saved is what we're doing tonight. 
You say, prove it gladly. If you were saved, if you got birth from above, if you got born again, if you got saved at a church meeting, whether that be a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or revival services, tent service, youth rally, but it was a church service similar to this. If that's where you met Jesus and got saved at, I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand hold them up. Don't let them down. I want you to look around at that. That's 90% of our crowd, y'all. You put your hands down there. And it's like that in every church I go to. I'm not saying this is the only place you can get saved at. It ain't. My dad got saved in the back of an insurance office. My grandparents got saved in a car riding down the road. They pulled over and got saved. You can get saved anywhere. My wife got saved at my parents' house in the kitchen. My mom led her to the Lord. What I'm saying is, though, by far, the biggest majority of the people in our churches got saved in meetings just like this. You know what that tells me? You don't got to be some super-duper dino whopping soul winner. Say, I don't talk to people real good. You don't got to. Can you at least take a track from the church that's got an Emmanuel Baptist Church stamp on it and hand it to someone and say, will you come sit with me Sunday? We got revival this week. Got a man from South Carolina named Brother Weaver going to preach and some wonderful singers from South Carolina named the Lancasters. Can you come sit with me on Friday night? And just, it's the great... You say, what happens? God moves. And they get away from their cell phone from a little bit and they get in a place that's conducive to worship and preaching and the Holy Ghost moving and God starts filling the pools up. It's a place of, of sparrows and swallows. It's a place of springs and showers. Lastly, I'm done. It's a place for service and for serving. Look at the last picture he gives us in verse number 10. The last picture he gives us right here, verse 10. He said, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. This man, he's done finally got down to the end near about this, this chapter, and he's basically telling us, that place has done so much for me. I'd like to give something back to it. God has done so much in my life through that place that I'd like to turn around and do something back. I don't just want to come and just say, well, what's in it for me? God help us. So many, so many of God's people now, the only thing they want from church is, what can the church do for me? What can the church do for my family? It does a lot for you. It'll keep your home together. It'll keep your life right. Keep your kids right. It does a lot for you. If they never took you bowling, if they never took you ice skating, if they never did a hot dog when he rose, if they never did a barbecue, if they never did some outing, if all they ever did was preach that book and sing and have worship, that's plenty. We're, but we're, and we, we, we do all kind of extracurricular stuff down there where I preach. But brother, it's almost getting to the place today where you have to do all kind of stuff to keep people. I refuse. The biggest draw we got at Bible Missionary Baptist Church is preaching, singing, worship. If that don't float your boat or suit your fancy, you have to find somewhere else to go. It should still be the biggest draw for the church. We're living in a day... Look, look, my goodness, my goodness, y'all. The fact is, if the power went out Sunday... It ain't going to mess y'all's worship service up none. Nor ours. Y'all can still pop up in here, light candles, preach, sing, and, and I mean, meet with God. Brother, if the power went out in most of your mega churches or big churches around this area Sunday, they ain't having church. They, they can't pump it up, prime it up dark the lights out shoot the laser beams fog it up they don't they, their worship shot brother if everything you got going on is shot because the power company turns it off you got the wrong power coming in the church amen we, we, we got we got the power that if Duke Energy or whoever knocks it out where we at we gonna still have meeting and we can still see God do something it's a, place, it's a place to service and servants. It's a place for exceptional serving. Watch how exceptional this is. Do you see what he said in verse 10? Watch what he said in verse 10. I, this, is, this is awesome. I love this. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Better than a thousand where? 
anywhere. <laughs> Take your pick. One day here, getting your pool filled up and getting your springs sprung up, experiencing the presence of God, one day here is better than a thousand anywhere. Take your pick. Take your pick. Theme park, ball game, hunting stand, shopping trip, whatever. Beach, mountain, river, whatever floats your boat. A day here, better than a thousand anywhere out there. That's what I, I'm telling you what he said. I'm inclined to agree with him. How, some of y'all sitting here right now, when I'm talking about that, some of y'all sitting here saying, how could that guy say that? I'll tell you how he could say that. His heart's right with God. See, when your heart's right with God, that's the way you feel. But when your heart's more in tune with the world than in the church, then you can't say that. <laughs> Exceptional service. And then he said, it's the place I'm done of embrace service. Sister, would you come help me give us something, Brother James, and I'm through. Embrace. Watch him embrace it. Watch what he says, the last part. I had rather. That's where we get that old southern word, my druthers. I'd druther. Southerners just, we shorten things. Ain't no sense in saying I had rather. So Southerners, we just going to shorten it. We just going to say I'd druther. That's I had rather, but we just shortened it to I-D-R-U-T-H-E-R, -E I'd druther. I'd rather, I'd druther. This is my druthers, if you give me my druthers. I'd just rather be a doorkeeper. I think one of the most inviting things of y'all's church is y'all got people just like that standing at the front door. That's wonderful. Can I just brag on all the doorkeepers that stand out there? I'm assuming it's like that when it ain't revival. I hope it is. I hope it ain't just like that revival. I mean, I'm sure it's not. I, I, there is not a more better advertisement for Emmanuel Baptist Church than somebody walks up on the property and immediately somebody meets them at the door and meets them when they come in the door smiling and shaking their hands and saying, we're glad you're here. This guy said, I'd just rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You say, what, why, why does he make that comparison? I'm going to tell you exactly why he makes that comparison. This is what, why he makes that comparison. He's saying this. He's saying, I've been out there. And I've been in here. Now, I'm telling you, I'd rather hang out here any day than go back out there for one more day. I've been in them tents of wickedness. I know what it's like, he says, to wake up and be messed up. I know what it's like not to have no peace and be that wandering bird. He said, but man, I found something here. And I'd just rather hold the door for everybody coming in and out than dwell back out there for one more minute. Because I found something here. I love this place. You ought to love it. You ought to live for it. You ought to try and get others in on it. Back it up. I read, I read, Brother Foster, I'm through. I read where the Bible said there was a certain group of priests that they had a key to the house of God and it was their job to open it every time they had worship. That's what it talks about over there in the Old Testament. And I thought to myself, I thought about preaching to our church. Would our church be open the next service if you had the only key because it says they was it, somebody had the key and it was their job to open the place for worship and I wonder if you had the only key would y'all be able to worship Sunday morning would everybody be outside on Sunday night saying well I wish so and so would show up because we, we ain't gonna get here no preaching tonight man you ought to love this place because God transferred this is what Jacob said when he is running, he said, This is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. He said the house of God is the gate. A gate is what lets things in and out. And when you get to the house of God, it's a place where God lets things from heaven out. But it's also a place where we, we get plugged in. And you don't get that anywhere else. And I just come by to tell you tonight, personal testimony of me and whoever this guy is. I love this place. It's my favorite place. 
I hope you do. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray you'd bless the message. I pray tonight, Lord, some worthless birds, wandering birds would be wise birds tonight. Oh, God, I pray tonight that you'd help us to get sinners to this place so they might hear the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, I thank you so much for what you did in my mother and father's life through the church. I am what I am today because you led them to a Bible-preaching church that changed their life. And oh God, it's done a work in my life. I thank you for it. I praise you for it. God, tonight I pray that you'd help us to magnify you and worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.